And hey, Eric, good to have you. Oh, hi, hi, sorry. <laughs> hi. Hi, Emily. Hello. Okay, this is a, a important moment for me because my uh, younger daughter is leaving back to go to school right now. Bye. <laughs> right now. So you have an excuse to hold back the tears then. <laughs> She's a junior, I'm not allowed to. All righty. In that case, I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. We can all see? Yep. Okay, good deal. So welcome. Maggie and John and I are gonna be talking about a new certificate that we've been working together along with several other people, including Emily, um, uh, to, to give us all an opportunity to apply inclusive teaching strategies um, in a more personal and data focused way. So welcome. We would love your feedback. This is a, this is a, let's just say a pilot phase. We'll call it a pilot phase for a certificate that we're going to be launching in spring. So feel free to jump in at any point. And I'm going to put this background slide up. Maggie and John, anything you want to add before I leap in? Well, we were already going to be doing a reading book on inclusive teaching. And when you brought up the idea, we thought this could be a nice supplement because mm -hmm. it is an area that I think we all need to work on, mm -hmm. that we lose a lot of students along the way. And we'd like to come up with ways of losing fewer students. So here's some background on wh what kinds of things um, brought us to this point. So one is, of course, that there is increasing expertise and research across the country on the power of inclusive teaching practices, what a difference it can make in student learning and student achievement um, from moment to moment in the classroom, as well as overall retention and graduation rates. And um, John mentioned the inclusive teaching reading group that cell is going to be running over the spring. It's a fabulous, fabulous book, but not very long, look at that. <laughs> um, which is a good example that um, the practices in, in that book and in much of this literature are very, um, they're concrete, applied, but also um, based on research data of achievement. Also, because of this kind of increasing expertise and in research in the area, oh my gosh, wait, I have to stop. Y'all know me? If you don't know me, I'm Kristen Croyle. I'm the Dean in Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I am a psychologist, and um, Maggie and John, would you like to introduce yourselves? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Maggie. I am uh, serving as uh, the Associate uh, Director of CELT, at least for the next uh, few weeks before Jessica <laughs> takes over, um, but I'm also an Assistant Professor in Criminal Justice. And I'm John Kane, an economist and the Director of CELT. And what, what'd you say about Jessica? Wait, sorry, little derail. Oh, um, Jessica Harris is gonna step in while I'm on maternity leave. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, and since we have a um, relatively intimate group here, let's say, can we do some other quick intros? Let's go around. Greg, you wanna start since you're unmuted? Sure. I'm glad you pointed that out. I didn't realize it was unmuted. So thank you for telling me that. <laughs> Greg Ketchum, Assistant Dean of Extended Learning, and really excited to hear more about this initiative today. Emily. Hi, I know there's two Emilys here, but I just jumped in. Emily Estrada. <laughs> I'm Emily Bovier. I am in the psychology department, and I just recently um, jumped into this work group that has been working on this certificate. So I'm here to also sort of bring myself up to speed with the things that we've been working on. 
Emily Estrada. Hi, I'm Emily. I hesitated because I felt like Emily B should go before Emily E, alphabetical order and all that jazz. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, and I'm excited to learn more about this certificate and inclusive uh, teaching learning more generally. Linda? I am Linda Oxenbein, and um, I teach in the, um, I'm a visiting assistant professor in the English and Creative Writing Department. Um, right. And I'm interested in this. I have been since they started talking about it and I want to go for the certificate, but I'm not sure it's going to fit this semester because I have a whole bunch of new things on my plate. So, but I have the book though. So. Awesome. Thank you. Prabhakar. Hi, I'm Prabhakar Kodandaraman. Um, I'm a professor of marketing who teaches sales and negotiation. I currently play the role of the dean for the School of Business. Grace? Hi, good afternoon and happy new year. My name is Grace Maxson Clark. I work for the EOP program and I adjunct for the School of Ed. Nice to see you all. Good to see you. Eric? Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a new assistant professor in the English department. And Annika. You're muted. We started with unmuted, we ended with muted. Uh, I'm Annika McAvoy. Uh, I work in the Triana Flu Institute, um, and I've also been on this committee. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing Kristen today. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for. Uh... Yeah, you, you're not, you're flexible, right? You can just jump around. And Ramin, Ramin. Yes. Well, Ramin Mohammadi, I'm the Associate Provost and excited to hear this presentation. Thank you. So let's go back to the background a little bit. So we were talking about how there is increasing expertise in this field. There's stuff to know that is worth knowing. And there are multiple opportunities for faculty to develop expertise. So, um, for example, some of our faculty, some of you have been through the AQ Effective Teaching um, Extended course, which includes content on inclusive teaching. Some of you have done the Cornell MOOC on inclusive teaching. There's a bunch of other opportunities. Uh, the um, difficulty with those is even when the content is very high quality, um, oftentimes it is, it is one way only so that you can absorb and decide how to apply, but there really isn't any feedback. So for faculty who are really interested in this area, there's often a desire for more in-depth practice and reflection and self-evaluation, or at least evaluation um, of our own equity data. So for example, if you were to do the Cornell MOOC, there are periods where you can stop and reflect, but there isn't anybody to tell it to. <laughs> and there, um, it, you can also, um, especially for those of you teaching somewhat larger classes, you can um, kind of do a quick and dirty look at equity data in your own classes, but, there is, but you don't actually have enough detail to do anything but guess. <laughs> So for example, if you wanted to look at, at um, race and ethnicity differences in grades, you could guess, but we all know that that doesn't give us uh, solid data. So there's a lot of opportunities for development and self-reflection, but there isn't much opportunity available for really in-depth reflection and evaluation of data. There's also um, a desire among some faculty to uh, more aggressively personally address equity in our own classrooms, that we feel a real commitment to do what we can every semester, each semester. So if there are more tools at our fingertips, we're interested in applying them. And there was, so we have a working group that's been working on this and we worked really, it, the title has been kind of a trick <laughs> because we're trying to convey that this, uh, that the certificate is designed for people who are really interested in application and reflection of that application so that you can really see what is working in your classroom and what is not. So right now we've got certificate in applied, equitable and inclusive teaching because the focus is really on application. So today we're gonna talk about some of the components. We'd love your feedback on the components, but we're, we're gonna start with, um, 
a little reflection on our own positionality. And we'll, we'll pause the recording in just a minute, so, but not quite yet. So um, many of you have done many things in your classrooms and personally to reflect. So today we're gonna use the social identity map. Social identity map is from Jacobson and Mustafa and it was um, specifically designed by them in order for faculty to reflect on their social identity in, and how it affects their practices of qualitative research. If you do qualitative research, it's an interesting article, but it's applicable to a lot of things. So in the social identity map, there are three levels that they want you to look at. So I'd like you to just sketch down a couple things on a piece of scratch paper or a little post-it on your computer, like an electronic post-it or whatever, however you'd like to sketch them. So in the social identity map, they suggest that you start with broad facets of social identity and you can lay out as if you were to do this with your students, you can lay out whichever ones you want or you can allow them to select their own. For the, our purposes today, I'd like you to pick three, any three you want, pick three fat, broad facets of social identity, um, race, gender, age, class, ability, uh, this is our, our um, any aspect that that you that you want to reflect on for a moment. Let's let's take uh, that should be quick. So pick three. Make a note. Would you like me to pause the recording now? Not quite yet. Okay, you just let me know. I will. Okay, you got three. Any questions so far? You're good. Okay. Then the next level, so for each of those three, think of how those social identity positions affect our lives. And for the purposes of our conversation, why don't you fo focus on how those different aspects of social identity have affected your educational experience? And by the way, we're going to talk about this, but there isn't anything you have to share, so I should have prefaced that. So fill in a, a few of those, how the two ways that each of those facets have affected your educational experience. And while you're reflecting on that, I'm gonna add the third level. They have three levels in their social identity map because they may start coming to you as you're, as you're thinking about the second level. The third level is reactions and emotions to the way that those have, um, those different aspects of our social identity have affected our lives. So you can fill in as you're thinking about it, you got your facet, how that has affected your life in particular at your educational experience and your reactions to how that has affected your educational experience. So let's take one more minute and you can jot down some ideas. Okay, just about 10 more seconds. So one reason that we're doing this today is that 
it's um, second nature for me, and I, I don't know about you, but it's certainly second nature for me that when I'm talking about pedagogy, I go to data. So you may not, not, for those of you who aren't in the social sciences, psychologists don't always have the reputation of being very heavily data oriented, but I'm certainly very data oriented. So it's easy to talk about pedagogy and, and its impact on students in terms of their achievement data. But pedagogy is also always personal. And when we're talking about inclusive pedagogy, it's also always personal. How are we understanding our classroom and our students' experience based on our, our personal experiences. So Maggie, why don't you go ahead and pause? All right. All good. Okay. So let's talk about the components of the certificate. And remember, what do we pick for, let's hold, hold on. Certificate and applied. And there were, there were versions that included things like advanced, like they were really long, advanced certificate and specially awesome applied. So this is, this is, it's designed to be essentially an advanced experience because it's designed for people who have already done some work in this area. So uh, the initial components are to recognize that, that many of you, I know you folks, many of you have already done Di uh, some didactic components focused on inclusive teaching. You've done some interesting things and you wanna do more. And many of you have also done some didactic components focused on accessibility. Like you may have done one of the accessibility 10 day challenges. You may have gone to 12 different self sessions on accessibility, maybe spread out over different breakouts. You can do a whole bunch of them um, this winter breakout. So that there's an idea that there's already um, that you've already, you're already familiar with the literature and some of the interesting content. But then beyond that, and, and those have multiple choices of things you can do, or maybe you've done something different and, and um, SALT can say, well, that looks really interesting. You've done your didactic component. But beyond that, after you've done that work, what could you do? So the foundational work, and then a self-review of teaching practices including some reflection on your own identity and positionality, a review of your own personal use of inclusive teaching practices, whoops, sorry, right now in the classroom, and uh, a peer review. And why those pieces? If you think of some of the really great um, development inclusive, in inclusive teaching, for example, this really great book. When you think about how to apply that, the, the first question is, what am I actually doing that's in there? And the book helps guide you through it. It's got some checklists itself. But then what else could you do? You invite someone who is skilled in the area to come visit your class and say, hey, this is what I saw. You think you, you're using this really welcoming language on this one hand, but on this other hand, you did this one thing. Were you aware of that? Wouldn't that be great to have someone who could come to class with you and give you that kind of feedback? At the same time, what you might wanna do next is to review your own student data focused on student equity and institutional research has agreed to help us with this. And there's no cookie cutter approach to this, by the way, because everyone is teaching different classes and different combinations of things. So for example, Emily Estrada has had a lot of students over the last year or two, a lot of students. And so has John. John has had a lot of students over the last couple of years a lot of students. So if we were, if they had questions that they wanted to ask institutional research about um, equity gaps in grades by um, race and Pell eligibility and ethnicity, those questions might be answerable with their own data and they could work with IR. And by the way, this would be a, a confidential conversation. The data is provi would be provided to you for your own development. But at the same time, um, some people, if we were working with someone in math, for example, even if they're teaching a pretty heavy course load, it may not be enough students. Eric, for example, is teaching in English in creative writing. He hasn't had hundreds of students or thousands if we're gonna look at John over the last three years. <laughs> yeah. So doing, doing that kind of, let's just break it down by demographic category and compare grades 
is not an, uh, a viable data question and would not have any interesting and useful answers. But there could be other data questions that would be interesting. Eric could ask questions, for example, about um, what type of student moves into creative writing and are there gaps based on who enters versus who is graduating and how do his classes fit in there? So I are, uh, if you've worked with Debbie for long before, they are very sophisticated. Um, she's very sophisticated in how she thinks about data and is very interested in, in um, working privately with faculty to create data questions that are answerable based on the institutional data that we have that are specific to your discipline and your position at the institution. Um, me, as an example, I, I get to teach a class every year or two. So my data focus questions would be very narrow, but still I have data focus questions. <laughs> and then the last step in the certificate would be to reflect and think about how to move forward with stronger practices. All of this can be done um, with a cohort of faculty or people every so often get together, they could share peer visit time, they could talk about their data questions, they could talk about how to move forward with their own stronger practices, but it could also be done individually um, with the support of CELT saying, you know, I'm ready for a peer visit, who do you suggest might be good to come to class, those kinds of things. So if when we launch this in the spring, um, we expect that there will be a group of people who are interested and that might be a nice cohort to run together. But if you wanna do it by yourself over the summer or some other time or spread it out and say, right now I'm gonna do a couple self-rating scales, work on some of those pieces later. I'm, I want a peer review. I'm not quite ready for data, but maybe I will be soon. It does, there's no particular timeline. Um, Maggie and John, do you wanna add anything here? Um, or we could go to the next one. Well, we could say yeah. there's still a lot of details <laughs> to work out and this is still in the planning stage, but where we have the inclusive mm -hmm. reading group, the reading group on inclusive teaching, it would be a nice way to start it with a cohort mm -hmm. so we could get more feedback on how to make it better and so forth. You know, so we'd encourage people to sign up now, but we're leaving op open the option of doing it individually at your own pace. Um, and, and I'll just mention that, um, you know, we've in prior reading groups have talked about um, having access to, you know, that student data on um, equity gaps in our classes. And I think it's, you know, by participating in this, you know, we really are able to gain some really important insights. And so for me, I'm really excited that, um, you know, we're going to be able to you know, get to see some of these patterns and trends over time and that uh, we're going to get some good help from institutional research on uh, aggregating that data for us. And so, um, you know, for, you know, all of, you know, people who are interested in participating in this, um, wow. who've had those questions, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to generate some of those questions in the reading group um, this spring and, um, you know, be able to, you um, you know, really, um, like Kristen was saying, like, you know, figure out what narrow or, you know, broad questions we can, you know, bring to institutional data for, um, for that particular element. Just following up on that, this is something that many institutions or a number of institutions have implemented as a dashboard where any mm -hmm. faculty member can go in and check on yeah. at any time. And institutions that have done that where they have access to such data have made some really large improvements in reducing some of those equity gaps. And I'm hoping that we get lots of people working on this and we make similar progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Provoker, what do you want to add? Um, so I just had a question. So when you talk about equity gap and data focused on student equity, are we talking about performance outcomes mapped on I mean, whether there is a differential performance uh, based on a student background, is that roughly yes. what it is? Yeah. Uh, so that, so what, I mean, while that data, I mean, we are able to see it because it exists, um, but then by the time that happens, it isn't, it, I mean, is there, I guess that what I'm asking is, are there plans to 
um, map how diverse the opportunities that exist for different students to perform so that the uh, the gap in performance comes down. Meaning, um, if it's the same scale of performance that we are using to measure everybody, right? Um, so it's it's there's not enough diversity in terms of opportunity for the student to show their learning. Um, because we are only measuring the outcome, we are not measuring what goes into it other than the demographic uh, uh, variable. So is the, are there scales that looks at a course and its evaluation pattern, which results in the performance to see how uh, rich or whatever this measure is, you know, how diverse uh, the student's extent of opportunities that's available to a group of students to showcase their learning and skill in a course upfront. Because what we would measure using IR is essentially performance when the things have already happened. And then it, it essentially um, is a trial and error. You, you, know, you, you tinker with then some of the things, how you um, measure or how you um, find out how, you know, whether they know something or not, the, the method of evaluation itself. So I'm just wondering in this um, uh, field of study, because I'm not familiar with that, are there any um, scales that tells you looking at a course syllabus and the pattern of evaluation that's presented saying that this course presents uh, some sort of inequity in terms of opportunity for the students to showcase their learning and the measurement model itself is pretty diverse. So it's, it's a good question. And part of what you're talking about is um, more programmatic than the focus here, because the focus here is really on individual instructor. There's all kinds of um, kind of interesting, some of it's preliminary, but interesting data about um, faculty who have access to equity gap data for their own classes to say, when I design it like this, I have this big gap, a, a racial gap. But when I design the course like this, same learning outcomes, the racial, the, the racial equity gap dramatically decreased. So at an individual level, there's certainly some data. What, just as one example, there are ways to construct a course and grade that highly um, reward incoming knowledge, right? You rock it on the first test, you're set up for the rest of the semester, you fail that first test, it's very, very difficult to recover for the semester. So that a student who comes in with a strong educational background is set up for success in a way that a student does, who doesn't come in with the same background um, cannot ever recover. Whereas there are other ways to set up the course where a student can learn throughout the semester and they aren't always hampered by poor performance right at the beginning. But those are, Individual, individual pedagogical choices that having access to individual level equity grading data can help to answer. I don't think, I don't know if I answered all of what you were asking. John, you, I saw you yeah, waving. A couple of things. One is that institutions that have been doing this have been really successful and they've written up studies of what has been affected. One example that will be mentioned in the reading group is something that Kelly Hogan did. She thought her class was very equitable and very inclusive until she actually saw data. It's really easy to ignore equity gaps when you don't have data on just how significant they are. And so one of the things she did is she read a little bit about prior studies, and she introduced just simply more structure on her assignments, adding more details on what was expected of students. And within a semester, those equity gaps for first gen and racial equity gaps were cut by at least half and some more so. At Cornell, when they introduced the Active Learning Initiative about five years ago now, uh, they've been actually studying the effect on equity gaps, and they found that racial and First gen equity gaps were eliminated in several departments by just introducing more active learning and reducing the amount of time people spent lecturing. So there's a lot of evidence out there, but people who think that their class is already equitable and are not aware of that data are not generally going to go out and look for solutions for a problem that they're not aware of. So the data is mostly, I think, useful in just making the issue more cognizant, more visible for people. And once it becomes more visible, it's it's easier to address it. 
Thanks. And we'll we'll add to this some logistics. Maggie, you want to talk yeah. about it? Yeah, sure. So um, the goal is to launch this uh, this semester. Um, again, you know, part of that reasoning was that we're doing this inclusive teaching reading group, um, and you know, um, Vigi Sathy and in, in Kelly Hogan's book is all about evidence based inclusive teaching, and so we're hopeful that'll be a really good um, didactic. Uh, elements for um, people who are interested in participating in this certificate. Um, and that, you know, we're inviting anyone who is uh, serving in a teaching role. And so as Kristen mentioned, she teaches, you know, a, you know, a course every year or two, um, you know, that would still be, you know, an important um, person to uh, participate in this uh, initiative. Uh, it's something that we're going to facilitate through CELT. Uh, we're working out some of the uh, small details on that, but like how we're going to um, do it. Like how we're going <laughs> to do it. But um, you know, our idea, and you know, we're also open to suggestions, is that um, we'll invite people to you know essentially join a course shell, and uh, people will be able to submit and track their progress. Um, you know, with completing each element of the certificate. Uh, similar to, you know, the AQ course as well, where um, you can, you know, see which elements you have left and um, opportunities to participate in completing those elements. Um, and this is something that, you know, as Kristen mentioned earlier, this can be completed in a cohort and, um, you know, with colleagues. And so if there's a group of people who are really interested in getting started on this this semester, I think that would be a really great opportunity for everyone. But of course, we know that there's, you know, various individual circumstances that may prevent, you know, getting um, a certificate completed in a specific time frame. And so if, um, you know, you want to work on the didactic component um, by joining the inclusive teaching reading group, that's wonderful, but if you need to, you know, get to some of those other elements over the summer or in the next semester, uh, that opportunity is is there for you as well. Thank you. And of course, anything else anyone wants to add to that? And we'd appreciate suggestions for yeah. people on how this could work well. But we, again, as Maggie said, we were thinking about doing it in Portshell, where people could upload a completed certificate, say, from the um, Quinelmu mm -hmm. if they wanted to. Or we would have data on that, and people would just say, I've completed the reading group and so forth. And that would be a check mark. And once all of the components are completed, a certificate would be generated within Brightspace. Yeah. Right. So, so just to. I had a question I was going to ask. Kind of, I think it's a bit of a follow up to what Provoker already said. Um, obviously, we have prerequisites for our courses. So, if a student meets the prerequisites, we have this basic assertion in our heads that they're prepared to do to take the course. But you know, the reality is the student's background do, does matter. Uh, we 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 know there is there is difference in performance and persistence based on certain prior criteria that the student may or not have met. But the other question about data that I have was relevant is that I know we don't always categorize the students, at least what we report to soon, fails to categorize students in, in, in the way they really are in terms of race. So, and I, I'm glad IR is involved in this because they have access to data that frankly, most of us can't necessarily know about besides our impressions, whether somebody's a student of color or not, for example. Uh, and, and I guess, to what extent have you guys talked to Yeti about how rich is this information going to be? Because the person who literally I, I self-identify as being uh, a white student, but they have uh, black or Hispanic in their uh, in, 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 in their background or identify themselves as uh, black. And, and if you look at them, you would never know because they are uh, some combination of black and Hispanic and black Hispanic and white or Native American. So I guess how much control is there on, on how this, this data is produced? I think that's, um... 
it goes beyond the needs of data for this purpose. So data for this purpose is used for individual pedagogical development. If we were to do a scientific study, for example, on the effect of being a visible minority on a predominantly white campus, then the, the cleanliness of the data and the way that those different categories are defined would be much more important. But I think what John was emphasizing before that we all think when we walk into class, we design our classes with the idea that we are giving everybody a fair shake to be successful in our class. And unless you have data to actually look to see if you are giving people a fair shake, it's easy to fool yourself into thinking that you are. <laughs> but having the data to look at it gives us um, more power. Now, yeah, individual level data down to the individual student, not super clean, that's okay. That's, that would be part of the conversation with IR saying, here's kind of the question I wanna ask, but here's the number of students I typically teach. Here's how my courses fit in the curriculum. And then it becomes a question of like, what data best answers the question that you want and how do we wanna combine? So if, for me in teaching very small courses, I mean, very occasional courses, how do I wanna combine things so that I can get a question answered given the level of the kind of cleanliness of the data. Yeah, uh, just to be clear, I think there was a comment about invisible disabilities. I'm telling you there are invisible uh, race, uh, race and cultural backgrounds that, 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 that we wouldn't know. We can't oh yeah, and that's Absolutely. what I mean about that's how the data could potentially help uh, understand. And two variables that I think capture a lot of that would be Pell eligible and first gen status, because in a lot of studies, those turn out to be incredibly important in affecting student success. And that wouldn't be free of any measurement or wouldn't have the same type of measurement issues. Thank you. So um, one of the pieces that is designed um, still in rough draft form, um, are self and peer rating scales that are really designed to provide an opportunity for reflection. They're not designed to be, for example, um, psychometrically sound. <laughs> so you wanna look at the reliability and validity, we're not doing that right now. Um, but instead they're designed to say like, here are some best practices in inclusive teaching. What aspects, how do you see yourself? Which aspects are you incorporating into your classes, which are not? recognizing that we all have blind spots. So also with a peer rating um, to, to get somebody to come and visit, whether that's an online class or a face-to-face -face teaching environment and to provide feedback. Now, there are a lot of aspects of inclusive teaching. So right now there's just, just to keep them from getting too long, there's little rating scales for course structure, for syllabus, for content and resources, the digital learning environment, classroom environment and interactions, assignments and exams, practices out Inside the classroom and reflecting on your practices that might seem like a lot but okay it is kind of a lot but, but they are very short so i'm going to show you an example um, uh, and given that it's 347 we're not going to go through them but here's an example so this is the um course structure one and it and it's see not not a super intensive rating scale there I'm not doing so great here. I'm doing really great. I have some room for, for improvement in the middle. So for course structure, things like you include multiple low stakes assignments and avoid high stakes assessments. Provide high structure for students with explicit and consistent requirements with what students should be doing before, during, and after class sessions. So for example, readings that are assigned before class have guided questions. Because one of the big um, themes in inclusive teaching literature is that students who have uh, come from backgrounds of educational privilege for various reasons, often have a much more detailed understanding of what a successful student does. So when you say, read this before class, they have a whole context of what that means. Whereas a student coming from um, less educational opportunity, when they, you say, read this before class, they may not have a strong understanding. Does that literally mean read? Does it mean read and take notes? Does that mean read and understand and be able to discuss? So having guided questions or stronger structure provides an even playing field for those students. Align assessments and activities with specific learning objectives, clearly communicate at each step what objectives you're trying to meet, 
incorporate accountability for meeting course requirements so that um, students understand, so that the course is shaped so that you ask students to do what they need to do to be successful instead of just suggesting that they do it. An example here for, again, a pre-class reading would have a required component that's due for students. So everybody does it. That there's an anticipated amount of time required to complete requirements. So for example, if you say, do this worksheet, have an, it should take you about an hour so that students have a sense when they're going in. Again, students with a lot of educational opportunities may walk into those assignments with a better sense of how long things take, whereas students without stronger educational backgrounds may not, and so on. So it's, it's, it's designed to cue you, what am I doing? Where could I improve? So that when you are looking at your data and thinking about the next steps that you wanna take, you've already identified some areas where you're really rocking it and some areas where you could use some improvement. So we, again, we said we would love your input and um, we're gonna share with you a one question survey. Um, John, if you have the link, you could put it in the chat or I can put it in the oh, chat. Um, oh, it's, can, it's actually two that. questions. Two questions, pardon me, two question survey about whether you'd be interested. And we'll also follow up with you with a, just a little uh, quick feedback form saying, what do you like? What do you not like? What do you wish was there? All that kind of stuff. And if you have other thoughts, we would love to hear about them. Um, and I'll also say thank you to our other um, working group members that aren't here today. There's Nicole Westerdahl from the library and Michelle Thornton from the School of Business, who I left out. That's it for now. That's it for now. So we're at time, but <laughs> we'll hang around for a minute. Thank you so much for your um, thoughts and your interest today. Again, if you've got thoughts, I would love, we would all love to hear about them. Any, th any um, closing thoughts you want to share? Uh, I just have one. Uh, it, it seems to me that the practices that, that were in that survey, uh, Kristen, they probably are useful for all students. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not as if, you know, any of those are particularly uh, just for being more inclusive in your teaching. It's just being a good teacher, frankly, having directions that are clear, uh, providing more directions on what, what you mean when you say read X, Y, or Z, uh, probably creating accountability to make sure they did read because for some students, maybe they will just read for the joy of reading. Other students might if they know you don't really check to see if they did or whatever, they might stop reading, which is not beneficial. I mean, any and all of those things perhaps will help everybody. Absolutely. And that, that, is, that is absolutely true of inclusive teaching strategies. Um, faculty who have been doing work in first generation achievement, for example, for 10, 15 years, there's, there's some familiarity here because the attitude is very similar. What, what can we do when we do everything in our power to structure our courses, to make them welcoming, to um, provide an environment of support so that students can be successful in our classes, even though, and celebrating the fact that they all walk in with many different backgrounds. I just thought of one more thing to tell you. I really enjoyed reading the relationship rich education mm -hmm. book. And, you know, I deployed some of the things I felt was the message with some of my students this past semester. And I can tell you, I had at least two students that maybe would have gotten a D in the course if I had done my normal thing. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them ended up with an A minus and one of them ended up with a B plus because they spent a lot of time with me and I, and I invited that connection. Uh, and I don't know to what extent that plays into what we're talking about here because I think in both students' cases, they were students of color. 
and I think they felt that I saw them and I knew, noticed them and, 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 and really tried to help them. And I think that perhaps has to be part of this dialogue besides good teaching practices because it, it's, it it's more yeah. than just good teaching practices that probably empower students to work hard. Oh yeah, absolutely. Knowing your, your students feeling that you see them and care about them is teaching practices. Definitely. Um, so, Kristen, just um, one thought. I mean, it's again for something down the road, just like we have accessibility score for our courses, right? Um, the, based on the survey that you displayed, it looks like more is better, right? The more flexible you are, et cetera. There is no um, you know, boundary condition uh, problems there. Um, so if that's the case, I, at some point in the future, you know, after you analyze some of the uh, data, et cetera, um, really it would be great to have um, a score, inclusivity score, so that my concern is that things can be changed before the launch of the course so that it's not like we wait till and then. So I, I just want to flip, just you said, you know, people think that everything is hunky-dory. Now I want, I'm, you know, if, what if we flip and say like, absolutely my course sucks in terms of it being inclusive. It must change. You know, and, and then if I just say, okay, let me go through this and get a score and, and try to improve. And so that also helps us kind of set a goal by way of programs, the number of courses, online courses, and so on and so forth. So just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, I don't want to throw your schedule off. <laughs> My main concern is I do have a podcast recording coming up mm -hmm. on chat. GD. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Oh, did you all hear that? He's doing the, uh, he's recording a podcast on chat GPT. It'll be probably coming out within a few weeks, my guess is. About uh, three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, thank you all. Um, before I forget, I will take a quick screenshot because we're going to follow up with you by email and see if you have thoughts that you want to share. But and otherwise, it's great to see all of you. want to do it too. So but yeah, we'll, we'll find you anyway and see if you want to join. <laughs> I already have it. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I got it. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Yep, John, I was saying I didn't know.